And what we're going to do today is something a little different. Uh, instead of the typical panel, we're going to do a talk show. And I'm the host, and these are our guests. Uh, and we're hoping that this will be a little more interactive and flow a lot better and be more engaging. Uh, media psychologists study the interaction, uh, the basic definition, the interaction of human behavior and technology. When we're talking about AR and VR and wearables and uh, the Internet of Things, we are really talking about bringing these technologies right into the heart and soul of the human being. Uh, and basically, what we do with technology is we, we tend to create our needs and our wants and our desires and our dreams and our hopes. And our behavior drives a lot of this. So it's, it's rather important as we move along through this technological evolution that we understand what human behavior really is and try to incorporate that into what we're doing because it's going to have some very significant psychological and sociological effects down the line. And we'd rather not try to fix the problems after they've occurred, but see if we can be a little proactive with it. So we put together a, uh, a, a very interesting panel of some of the uh, leading experts in the field of media psychology. Uh, and I'll go a little more into depth into uh, their credentials, but basically just to let you know what their are. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Shane Pace, and uh, Shane, you'll be talking about inattentional blindness and augmented reality. Right, and visual perception. And visual perception. Okay, and Dr. Curry Perry. Be talking about multitasking and cognitive load. Right, lots of cognition. This is important stuff. Pay attention to it. And uh, Sean Tennis. Um, Neoanthropogenic psychology. All right. He will define that for us, and he'll break it down into syllables so that we remember how to pronounce it. And uh, then Jerry Lynn, Dr. Jerry Lynn Hogg. Privacy, ethics, and ownership. Uh, that's a big thing when all of our stuff is out there. OK, you got that thing? You ready to go? Yep. Keep going. Keep going. Next. OK, so first up. We have uh, Shane, and uh, Shane, tell me a little bit about uh, what you've been up to. I, I read some of your bio, and I, I, when do you get to sleep? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I have an 11-year-old, a PhD, and multiple jobs, like I'm sure many of us do. Yeah, but so, you're, yeah, you're, sleep, you're, is, you're, sleep is not something you're I You're starting uh, two companies right now. Right. Right. Uh, so I got uh, one with, with uh, uh, Shane, uh, Sean. And, uh, and Jerry Lynn. And Jerry Lynn. Right. So uh, we're, we're, we're looking at how do we use augmented reality um, to create story? How do we use it to really have a, a, a tremendous impact on, uh, on the user? So be it from a, a social perspective, be it from a psychological perspective, a cognitive perspective. We're looking at all these things. And how do we use the AR technology for that purpose? And uh, so you have Media X LLC. Right, we've got Media X LLC, which is a media production company, and then we have another company called The Lot Project, which we work on uh, um, augmented reality and storytelling. All right, and you're doing books, and, and writing the textbook yeah, okay. on augmented reality. Yeah. All right. Lots of cool stuff. Well, thank you for taking some time out to yeah. be here. Uh, oh, so uh, we mentioned before that you had an interest in in uh, visual perception, in attentional blindness. Uh, why that? I mean, there's so many areas you could go into. Why did you zero in on this? Ten years ago, when I saw augmented reality for the first time, uh, my mouth literally hung open for 15 minutes during a presentation. And uh, Dr. Gary Hare can attest to that. He was sitting with me in the audience. And from the minute I saw it, I knew that was what I wanted to uh, delve into as a psychologist. And what, what happened when I started looking at it from a, from a very critical clinical perspective was it started popping up the, the limitless possibilities, but it also started popping up the questions of, okay, how does this interact with us as human beings, especially uh, in my area of expertise and interest is in visual perception and perception in general. So I wanted to know, okay, so we're putting this stuff out there in a dual plane situation of information presentation. How does that affect us? Well, how does it affect us? 
it, well, it has quite a few <laughs> interesting, interesting effects. Um, the one that I wanted to delve into with research immediately was one that always concerned me, um, and that's with attention. We only have so much attention that can go around. So when I'm presenting two planes of information, especially when it's designed by somebody who understands the concept of persuasive design, my desire is to keep you glued on to that augmented content for as long as I can, right? It's click-throughs, it's return on, or it's eyes on screen time. So I thought, okay, well, there's a concern. If, if I've got you glued on there, how long can I keep you glued on there before other things can't be perceived or we start to have some issues? So um, looking in the world of psychology, we look at selective attention and things like that. Um, so it, it's a visual thing, though. So let's, let's go ahead and play this video that's uh, on the next slide. One more. Please play. Yay. That's a start. I think you're going to have to play it. Oh, my God. All right. So had this played, <laughs> what you would have seen is oh, a very famous. Wait, wait, don't. Just give, give them a chance. All right. You know what? Go ahead. See if they can figure it out. Maybe we can come back to it. No, it's, no, no we're, we're pressed for time. Right. So what you would have seen, um, no, no, it's the one back. No, nope. go back. Okay, okay. well, it, it's it's crucial at this point. So we'll just we'll move on. So if if, if what I was going to show you is a very famous uh, psychological video. It's from uh, Simons and Chabri. It's called the Gorilla Basketball Experiment. In essence, what it is is you have a bunch of people passing a basketball back and forth, players in white shirts, players in black shirts, and your task is to focus on the amount of times the ball is passed between the players in the white shirts. So that's all you're supposed to do. You're supposed to count. Now, the players are moving all around the screen um, while they're passing the ball around, and halfway through the video, a guy in a gorilla costume walks across the screen. Now, some of you are shaking your head. How many people have seen this? Uh, oh, my God. I'm glad that right, video didn't right. play because then it'll look on. silly. Uh, so, it, what's shown in that is about 50% of the time, people don't see the gorilla. No matter how many times you told them, I swear to God, I didn't change the video, there was a gorilla in it. No, 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 there wasn't a gorilla. Let's, let's ask, the first time you saw it, how many saw the gorilla? Yeah. That <laughs> So that's a, that's a huge number. And on average, what we see is about 40 to 60% of the participants who take that video, regardless of age, actually younger kids now, uh, the digital, uh, digital natives, actually see the gorilla far more often. But the vast majority, 40 to 60% of the time, people don't see the gorilla. Uh, and that's what we call inattentional blindness. Uh, and it's the theory of when we are seeing things, we can take in millions of bits of information all the time. The difference is, is we can't always perceive everything we're seeing. We would just have this massive overload in our heads. So the theory of inattentional blindness was born to say, if I can transfix your attention on one specific thing long enough, if an unexpected item or an object passes before through your visual field that would normally be something you would see, like a gorilla walking through a basketball game, that um, you won't be able to see that because your perception is limited and you can't perceive more than a couple things at a time. Um, so that was something that concerned me right away with augmented reality because that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to look at this digital thing that I'm putting in your real world. And if that's the case, if you're playing a game out in the real world or you're using GPS out in the real world, are you going to experience inattentional blindness and potentially you know, harm yourself, walk off a curb, walk in front of a truck, trip over a baby stroller, whatever? So what I decided to do was run the first experiment of its kind utilizing uh, a mobile augmented reality application in the laboratory um, and find, uh, or see if I could find inattentional blindness um, uh, incidents. So you can go ahead and hit the next slide and just pass this video as well. So we got plenty of incidents that we know in the real world that inattentional blindness does happen. I mean, we've got plenty of, of, of data, texting and driving, texting and walking. I know it's not the same as AR, but it, it's the same concept. If I divide your attention, you can't always perceive the most important things that you should be perceiving. You know, we've all seen the, you know, the videos of the bus crashing because the guy is driving while he's texting, uh, a woman falling in a fountain because she's texting, etc. Um, so I decided to do the same thing with a mobile augmented reality application in a lab. And uh, so what I did was, oh, the video slide disappeared. Set it up in the lab, and I had um, a real-world video playing on a, on a street. Uh, on a full-size screen, so the participants would hold the, the AR application in front of the screen while the screen played behind them. And um, 
they had a counting task on the video itself, very similar to the Simons and Shabri Gorilla basketball video. Um, and what we found uh, after running the experiment, next, was that 60% of my 107 participants using the AR application experienced inattentional blindness. That's huge. That means we have to start talking together as developers and psychologists to determine what are the optimal levels of information that we can put up on that screen to safely let your users uh, navigate the real world and interact with the technology that you want them to interact with? Uh, Shane, um, are there counter arguments to this? I mean, we're, we're kind of pushing that this is a, a given. Are there other opinions about this? There are other opinions. There's two counter arguments to uh, inattentional blindness. Um, first is a theory called inattentional amnesia. And it's the idea that when we're running these lab experiments or when you have an incident of inattentional blindness, what's happening is you are perceiving it. It's just when I've asked you about it, you've already forgotten that you perceived it. Um, but that's been uh, discounted by when we, when we do experiments in the lab, what we can do is we can limit the time it takes from the exposure to the unexpected phenomenon, uh, or the unexpected uh, visualization rather, um, to the time I ask you. So it can literally be milliseconds. Did you see something? Um, and we still see 40 to 60 percent of the uh, uh, participants experiencing inattentional blindness. And the other counter argument is that, um, well, of course you don't see it because it's unexpected. So if it's an unexpected item, you won't see it. But if it's expected, you are aware that it's coming, then yes, you will indeed experience uh, no inattentional blindness. And the simple argument to that is, well, of course, if, if I run up and slap you in the face and you don't expect it, you're going to be surprised. If you are told this is going to happen, then there are, of course, not going to be any experiences of inattentional blindness. Um, so there, there's something there to potentially think about uh, as we do research and move forward, the development of applications is if we can get applications to not be predictive, but be interactive with the environment enough so that it could point out some of these things, we might be able to limit that. So yeah. let's hear from uh, some of, of our guests here about, uh, about this. Uh, does any of this cross over into any of your areas of expertise? Uh, Certainly Sarah. crosses over into mine. Okay. All right. Uh, Shane or... or you're good to go at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, so we're kind of winging it, folks. Yeah, we're kind of winging it. But, uh, okay, so Carrie, you, you spent a lot of time uh, with cognition. Uh, can you briefly define what you mean by that before we go forward? Sure. Cognition is, can you hear me? There we go. Cognition is how we learn, how the brain processes information. And I want to segue from Shane's talk and talk about an extension of inattentional blindness, and that is what we call cognitive load. Cognitive load, simply put, is there is a limited amount of brain bandwidth available for a specific task at a specific time. Now. I have a really cool video from my good friend, David Copperfield. I don't know whether it will play. Keep going. Keep going. That's not available. Not available. David's going to be so disappointed because he was hoping to extend his reach outside of Vegas. He disappeared. <laughs> and now, oh, he's gone. Okay. Let me ask you a question. How many of you took an airplane to this conference? Okay. Let me ask you another question. How many of you think you're adept at multitasking? You're so mistaken. <laughs> OK. So many of us believe that we are adept at multitasking. Unfortunately, that's a myth. It's not really true. Now, it's not that the brain doesn't have the capacity to hold a tremendous amount of information. After all, it is a supercomputer, so to speak. What is the problem is 
What we think of as multitasking is really switch tasking. Now, in our landscape today, we are constantly bombarded with information. Advertising will tell you that it's about 30,000 messages a day, but depending on who you ask, that number is going to fluctuate a little bit. That is a lot of information for you to take in, synthesize, make sense of, and then, as a professional persuader would like for you to do, remember it and then act upon that information. As technology has increased, as we have become much more reliant on said technology, we are expecting of ourselves to be able to adroitly go from one task to another, pick up where we left off, and continue on without any kind of loss of productivity. But that's not what's happening. A survey in 1996 actually, or a study, sorry, found out that designers, if they were tasked with working on multiple projects simultaneously, their productivity levels drop to 15%. Now, employers don't like 15% productivity rates. Okay. The real problem with this is the fact that we believe that we are capable of multitasking. And instead, what is happening is we are creating a tremendous amount of emotional stress And there are a lot of physical repercussions as a result of that. How does that directly relate to AR? That sounds very general across so many businesses. Um, How do we tie this into AR? Why is that specific for here? Well, augmented reality is adding another layer of complexity to a digital message that is going to further tax the cognitive load abilities of the brain. So we are expecting the brain to do more simultaneously, and it's not that the brain can't function, it can't function well. So you have to take into consideration that if you're going to add layer upon layer upon layer, you have to understand the brain's ability to cope with this information is better done in chunks than in just more, 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 all at the same time. So a question to the panel, whoever wants to to answer it is, um, so what's the message for the developer of an AR, uh, um, VR, any of of the products? What is the message about this? What What should they do with this information? Well, you have to take into account the, uh, the human capacity to adapt to new ideas, new tools. And it's been the case throughout history. Um, each new tool has changed the ability for us uh, as society in general to process that information and accept it, make it mainstream, and move forward with it, and make it something that improves humanity. And if I can, I'm just going to go back to my question of how many of you took an airplane to this conference. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my pilot of the plane that I'm on to be focused only on flying. I don't want any distractions in that cockpit. I don't want his cell phone going off and letting him know that there's a Facebook post that he really needs to respond to or to take a selfie while he's flying that plane. Now, the Federal Aviation has a certain flight operations manual that the pilots have to follow. But what happens when something unexpected occurs? I want my pilot to be able to go, okay, The plane is on autopilot, now I can handle this crisis, but also to understand that he's got to remember at what point that he stopped in that one task. But isn't isn't technology evolving in, in, using your example, isn't technology evolving into the cockpit as well? Absolutely. 
head up displays, actually, there was research done, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, something like that, that I don't think that we've really paid attention to. And if we're bringing augmented reality into the cockpit, which the Navy has already done, there's all kinds of heads up displays. And if you talk to the pilots that have been involved in that, it's an adjustment period for them to go from the old way to the new way. And that goes right into well, what you were talking about, the evolutionary psychology. Yeah, and it does. I want to bring this back to Shane for a second, though. Uh, because, Shane, part of, part of the visual perception that you've been involved in uh, when I've heard you speak uh, has a lot to do with uh, these head displays. Right. right. So and there's a the problem there. Yeah, th there's a really famous. He's very adamant about this. So I, I want to hear <laughs> what this is. I am adamant. I love AR, but I'm adamant about the changes we need to start researching. Um, there's a really famous study by Haynes uh, for NASA and uh, JPL at the Ames Research Center, I believe. Uh, and it was done, I believe, in the, uh, the, the late 1990s. And what Haynes did, uh, following Kerry, was he put pilots, commercial pilots in a flight simulator with heads-up display. And AR is just another form of heads-up display. And he had these pilots fly their routes that they would normally fly on a commercial route over and over and over again. Uh, and after about three or four flights that they had done in the simulator, um, he would randomly throw in a 747 jet on the runway as an incursion. Well, because the pilots got so adapted to using heads-up display for their telemetry, they were just looking at that front plane of data, and they weren't looking at the background plane, which is the real-world plane. And so what happened was 30% of the pilots that were landing in the simulator didn't notice the 747 in the runway. Now, these aren't new people. These aren't your average, everyday consumer. These are highly trained pilots that had difficulty adapting to this new technology. So when we're talking about the consumer, it, it takes it to a whole other well, level. And the consumer end, um, you had mentioned it at some point in the conversation, I heard you say something about um, um, dizziness, uh, uh, nausea. Oh, when we're talking about VR. VR. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, when we're talking about VR, it's a, it's a totally different ballgame. You start talking about VR sickness. Can you go into that a little bit? Because that's, that's uh, fairly interesting as well. Well, uh, everybody knows design, what v right? VR sickness is, yeah? Yeah, anybody that's spent more than five or ten minutes with Oculus Rift knows what happens to your stomach and your head. Um, and it, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, everywhere you go as a human being, you have a nose that you follow, right? So you look down, and even though you will visually still uh, perceive your nose, you don't always think about seeing your nose. So it just disappears, but it's always there. It always leads you. It always gives you an anchor point. Um, also, with, uh, with a VR, you're, you're not, well, some, may, some are starting to, you're not able to visually track. You have to literally turn your head to see where you're going. But now you can, with some of the area they're developing now, you can look around. So that's the second problem that leads to um, the, the, the virtual reality sickness. Okay. And the third problem, um, which creates more than just the nausea, is the idea that you have no sense of self in most VR. Most VR, you look down and you've just disappeared. Well, and that's cool for about five minutes, but when you're involved in anything that you would normally see yourself in, especially in any, any type of first-person situation, it's very disconcerting over time to not see your body, not be able to see your hands. So that's why I think you're starting to see more and more companies getting to front-facing scanners and cameras on, on VR. And hopefully those things combined with better resolution um, and uh, will hopefully reduce some of the VR sickness. And I, I also wanted to uh, link some of this conversation uh, to uh, uh, Sean. Uh, when we're talking about uh, our brains and the effect of this on our brains, that seems to, to link closely to what your interest, you, what is it called? Neo? Neoanthropogenic psychology. psychology. Yes. Okay. Neoanthropogenic psychology, or as I like to call it, NAG psych because I nag about it, not because of the initials. It, uh, it essentially is basically saying that yes, this technology is moving along and evolving, but we aren't evolving as quickly as the technology. And um, if we move along the slides here, keep on going there, hold it right there for just a second. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with the singularity and first props to Ray Kurzweil for putting this together. And you should know that he put this together in the 80s. So the fact that we see um, the movement here along the base timeline of the years and the uh, computing power, power 
as it moves towards what's known as the singularity, if you're not aware, where uh, one laptop will have the power of all human brains on the earth, um, which is predicted uh, pretty soon here. That's in the 2045, I believe. Um, the, the concept of that happening is, is all well and good, but as others will argue, including Miguel Nicolilas, who uh, is one of the preeminent neuroscientists, that the brain is not necessarily just an algorithm and it can't be reproduced so easily. And so the singularity is then a myth. Go on to the next slide. Now, what I study here, another graph done by Ray Kurzweil, um, is life. Life begins way over there on that corner. And as we see, it goes all the way to this point where it shoots. This is a countdown to the singularity. It shoots to primates, and they have what's called the FOX2 gene, and it and allows for speech. And you may have been in the keynote speech earlier this morning where Ori talked about um, language and how we have evolved with language. That's how we've evolved, that incredible exponential growth at this point. And now we're here down at the bottom at personal computer, and that's just where the personal computer starts. So today, <coughs> we're literally launching forward with our technology. We're all very excited at this, uh, at this conference, talking about what's coming in the next few years, and we need to be cognizant of where we are as human beings, how our brains are developing. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were you know, humans at, at five feet tall as average height, five four, something like that. And by the end of the 20th century, we're looking at 5'10", and that's because of the change in our, in our dietary habits and uh, abundance. And as abundance it continues to grow, um, we'll see more of that going forward. Our brains have shrunk over the years, and you know, people wonder why that is. Well, I would argue that they've shrunk because of efficiency. And there's less of a need to put more calories toward the brain when we supply places to retrieve information. We don't need um, RAM power as much. We don't need storage space as much in our brains. Instead, we have access to knowledge through the cloud. And I would argue that over time, that's going to make a difference. And it's not that well, far in the future. Let's stop there for a second. Yeah. Um, We've got a bunch of educators here, and probably a few in the audience, not to mention uh, parents and grandparents, that are um, they're bemoaning the loss of uh, abilities to read and to reflect and to critical think deeply, uh, that everything is much too shallow and much too fast. Uh, and at the same time, you're saying brains are shrinking, which seems to make sense if we're not using part of it. There's a, there's a, a biological process called apoptosis, which is basically cell death if you don't use it. The body doesn't want to keep it because it's inefficient to keep it. So it gets rid of it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to balance what you're saying here, that uh, we, uh, the, as the personal computer, personal computer gets stronger and can do more for us, uh, we're doing less of what we used to, and our brain's becoming more efficient, but what is it becoming more efficient at? It's, it's the end of times. <laughs> the end of times. <laughs> All right, so I should be buying no, it, camouflage. It's, uh, ideally, what we're looking at here, and, and what my focus is, really isn't to upturn the apple cart. It's really to look at it as another tool in the toolbox. We've gone through... Uh, millennia of changes um, when each new tool is is added to our toolbox even from the very first branch that we used to extend our reach and our arms got shorter and we lost all of our fur um, and as we become more connected through the internet and at the same time divided not geographically but divided in our belief system it's really important for us to remember to reach out to other belief systems and uh, to set our biases aside, to stay connected, to keep our gene pool of ideas flowing between one another so that as a society, we uh, grow and flourish and advance humanity, the doing for good, as opposed to becoming more isolated and um, uh, more conflicts breaking out between one another. Hmm. Um, We're thinking different. 
it's not that we have stopped in our assessing or our critical thinking, we're just thinking differently. And connections is so important. We're communicating differently, but we haven't stopped communicating. We're communicating differently. Yeah, right. It's additive. It's not replacement, it's additive. And, and that's, that's an important understanding. And when we recognize how that's occurred over, over the years where people have become very concerned about the addition of new technologies, um, and this is a new technology, how do we look at the digital natives versus the digital immigrants and we say to one group versus the other that it's not something that's being taken away, but something being added to increasing the comfort level for this group of people to let them know they will not be left behind and to allow them to embrace it. As an okay. educator. Yes. And as a professional persuader, it's really important to me in my classes that my students become immersed in the content. And that's where the extension of their critical skills is going to be. They're going to have to think deeper. But see, that's my point. They don't seem to be. Uh, they are inundated with so much information um, that they're skimming over it. They're getting the piece they need and they're moving on. And we do see this in education. We do see it in education, not in my classes, John. I believe that. Okay, not in my classes. What's important, though, is the connections that we make with the information that we have. If I bring in augmented reality into a classroom, which I have done with a lot of adult learners, again, it's additive. I am taking and using a fact and helping them draw conclusions by adding a, an additional visual element that helps learners see it, think it, feel it, maybe smell it at some point, mm -hmm. okay? And so again, I'm enhancing the learning experience. I'm using the content as the base for the knowledge, but then I am immersing them. But that's them. in the classroom. I do right? it online as well. No, well, or online classroom. But right. I'm, just, I'm talking about the people that are not in school. Uh, they're out of school, they're, they're in the workforce, they're doing whatever. Are they going deep? So uh, we're not going to answer that here, but I want to put it out there that um, while we have this amazing influx of information, what we seem to be losing at the moment is some of that depth and that exploration of content. We're not funneling down into it, which means that we're making conclusions. It might mean we're making conclusions without having all the information that we need. Um, I, I want to, to kind of switch gears just a little bit uh, because we also have in all of this information that is out there a lot of privacy and ethical considerations. And these are uh, extremely important, I would think, uh, for people involved in uh, these new technologies, especially the ones where we are directly interacting and putting ourselves into these technologies. And I think, Jerry Lynn, you're probably the best person to... Uh, to speak to this. Well, I've always been interested in how media and technology influences how we think, how we make meaning, how we connect. And I've used uh, our core psychological drivers haven't changed as we um, add different types of technologies. I've liked, I always am interested in studying, you know, what is lost, if anything, what is gained as we use new tools. And I want to think of them as tools because they're just different ways of being able to do the, these things that we want to do as far as being able to, excuse me, connect and make meaning. Um, so when we think of privacy, one of the disruptive things I want to give you right now is, can we think about privacy in a different way? Can we think of ownership in a different way? And how do we set our ethical guidelines there? Privacy is a relatively new way of thinking the way we do right now. It used to be in rural and tribal communities that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. So that idea that we keep what we do um, secret from everybody else or just uh, among our immediate family and friends is still a relatively new concept. 
So now we have that issue that all this information is available. We're collecting data, which is very helpful, medical settings and things like that, to be able to uh, know where we're located in our phone, being able to pick that up and give us uh, direction, information, et cetera. But then that challenge then of having that information out there, what do people know about us? So the uh, Pew Internet Research has done some research on, on, on what people think about their um, information being collected. And it's interesting, I don't know if you have the, uh, I think it's the next slide or two. Oh, the video? Oh, good. The video's going to play. Let's watch this for a minute. It's actually going to play. Is it? Yeah. It is. Do I think that data privacy is a serious issue? It's not like on the front of my mind. I think we are pretty secure. I honestly, I don't feel too threatened. So I'm just like, allow, allow, allow. I agreed to let this app change my device's call log, including incoming and outgoing calls data. So why would they want to change my call log? Do you have any idea? I allow this app to record audio at any time without my confirmation. That's pretty terrible. This may allow the app to share or save my calendar data regardless of confidentiality or sensitivity. It's offensive. I give this app permission to modify calendar events and send emails without my knowledge. I give the app permission to read my text messages. Read my text messages? Read my text messages. What? I allow this app to modify my contacts. To modify my contacts. Modify my contacts. That's scary. I give this app permission to read my personal profile information. Ugh. I give the app permission to use my precise location. It's not something that I think anybody else needs to know. I agree to let this app automatically turn off airplane mode. Turn off airplane mode. Is that real? It's insane. I give this app permission to read all data about calls on my device. Yeah, that's up. Why would they do that? That I'm actually kind of surprised about. And these are real? Is that true? Oh. <laughs> Oh well, thank you for alerting me to all this really bad I feel like I'm giving over my life to an app. <laughs> I should probably start to read these things. So let's face it, how many of us all say yes, go ahead, right, with the app, exactly. In other words, if you're asked to agree to the terms and conditions to be able to download the software, we all realize that the only way we're going to be able to use that software is to agree to the terms and conditions. And who know, how many of you read all of those terms and conditions, right? So I think the idea, the takeaway here is that we have to start thinking about this in new and different ways. And how can we... Um, be able to protect our privacy and uh, do we need to think about privacy in a different way as far as people if they want to find out that information it's already out there. How can we bring that in to augmented reality and virtual reality and the wearables I think is, is very big because the idea that we're walking around a lot of us have our you know jaw bones or our Fitbits or something or now our new eye watches on our wrists that is collecting all this information that um, as psychologists we talk about the, uh, the motivation that you can get from uh, using some of these apps. So we need to think about privacy, how we're going to be able to protect what's important to protect and what information um, is okay to be out there and, and th try to come up with some policies that make sense for all the people involved in that. So Jerry Lynn, yes. uh, just to jump in, because uh, we're running a little short on time, uh, but are you seeing any changes in people's perceptions of privacy? I know early on, uh, Facebook, MySpace, nobody cared. Everyone was posting everything up there. There was, there was uh, 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 what we call the online disinhibition effect. When you're online, you have that kind of barrier between you and the other. You're more free to put stuff out there than what you would do if you were face to face with someone. So we had people throwing all kinds of stuff out there. Well, now we're, we're, we're a lifetime in terms of technology uh, timelines into a new phase. Are you seeing any differences so, or are they still doing this? So, I, I, and again, I agree. At first, we weren't thinking about 
where that data was being collected or what kind of information was being put out there and how it would be so readily available to us. Um, I have an example that happened with social media recently, and I think it really has to do with a lot of people being naive, but how this information can go out there. So someone um, was trying to promote something, so they took information off of someone's Facebook page, copy and pasted it, and then put it into a Twitter account and sent that information out and tagged it. Well, a face value doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but you know, you, you're looking at how is that message changing, what's being sculpted, what kind of information is out there. And we are a cut and paste society now. So we have the issues with, is that the music singing us out? Yeah, yeah. we're because uh, <laughs> we did go long, right? We're winding but down. that actually leads into ownership, which I'll give a big last takeaway with that, and we can wrap it up. But that idea that we are a cut and paste society now, and certainly with augmented reality, we've, we're talking about issues where you can create spaces, and at what point, uh, where do you assign that ownership? because you are taking maybe copies of certain things to create a certain space. So we need to start looking at ownership in um, different ways also, so that we can appropriately um, be able to create these kinds of environments that are very valuable, such as being able to take someone to a, a space that they wouldn't physically be able to get to, so let's say go visit some Grecian ruins or something like that, and be able to have that kind of space. And, uh, okay. No, so. uh, no sorry, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I want to give uh, our studio audience some, some time uh, to see if they have any burning questions for us. So let me see, uh, it, it would probably be helpful to, where do we got? Back of the house. While we're running up there, one of the things that, um, that we've found many times as media psychologists uh, through studies is that even though the myth is that nobody gives a damn about their privacy anymore, the reality is, is when you actually go and you interview these people and you tell them the details of what these things are actually asking for, um, yes, they're willing to click, okay, go ahead, install that app, I, I want it, and I'm free to give my privacy stuff up. What they're finding is the people trust the developers, the programs, that they're not going to take away uh, information that's inappropriate. Um, so that's one thing that needs to be uh, known as a reality, not a myth. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you familiar with the principle that Douglas Adams put forth about the somebody else's problem field? Oh, somebody else's problem. You're, you're, I mean, you can't see it. You won't see it. Your brain won't let you see it because you think it's somebody else's problem. You don't know how to relate to it. So it just becomes a blind spot and totally invisible. Well, also, we can add to that uh, that there's a sense of learned helplessness over time that uh, we feel that we don't have the power to do anything about it, and so we just accept it and move on and hope that it doesn't hurt us in some way. And additionally, all the stuff that I've been talking about with uh, the singularity and those kinds of things, there's this optimistic outlook that says, and all you have to do is give up your privacy. You know, all you have to do is share all this information with us and we can make these things happen. And guess what? They're right. Question over here. Uh, the region of my brain for spatial recall if I'm a taxi cab driver in London is about three times the size of yours or mine. So Google introduces maps, and you know we everybody's got that. Where's it go? I mean, what regions of the brain are enhanced when I, the taxi cab driver can remember where <laughs> Prince Charles Muse is, but they can't remember their wife's birthday or their dog's name. So <laughs> what happens? What, what's being enhanced? Well, I mean that that's exactly right. I mean that's a great example because right there we've seen how the brain rewires the plasticity of the brain. Um, and we're not talking about, in that particular case, evolution. We're talking about learning and the way the brain rewires. <clears throat> but over time, as no one is using that, that region of the brain is going to shrink. And we have one right here. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but panelist two, the gentleman is just speaking. Um, you seem to imply that uh, our brains are evolving uh, due to the impact of computers and computerized memory and overdoses of input, are you really implying that evolution has speeded up to decade length instead no. of no. millennia? No, not at all. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't mean to imply that. What I, I, I tried to separate, our brains are growing smaller, but, and it's as a result of our using new tools. 
the latest tool is computers and such, it will have an impact. In fact, it is having an impact, but it's not a noticeable impact. Our brains are Thank too you. plastic right now to be evolving into natural selection. Um, and the fact that the uh, exponential curve is growing faster implies, that does imply, that evolution will also grow faster. Elephants, for example, are naturally selecting shorter tusked males now because of the pressure that they're under with the longer tusked males being poached. Interesting. Um, sorry we have to cut it off. We really had a lot more, but we have one more comment, one more to wrap it up. So, so we all have varying areas of, of interest and expertise, and I know it's a, a pretty broad spectrum that we talked about here today, but the most important thing is that all of us are concerned with one main thing, uh, ultimately, and that's the idea that what we're doing with technology has a direct effect on the human condition. Um, and in, in order for us to create the best possible products for our end users, for our consumers, to keep them safe, to keep them engaged, to get as much data as we want, um, there's got to be a balance. Uh, and one of the ways that uh, we can find that balance is to work together, psychologists and technologists, to do the research and to do those studies, um, to find out what are, the, what are the critical points that we need to explore. Uh, and we're just start, starting to uh, really get into that now. Um, so I'd encourage all of you as, as coders, as developers, as enterprising people, um, reach out to us. And we're more than happy to uh, partner with you. And one way to reach out is that we're going to be in the bar for most of the night tonight. <laughs> Uh, if you want to learn more about media psychology, uh, how media psychology can help you or assist you in what it is that you're doing or thinking, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, um, we do our best work after we've had a few drinks, so uh, come out and visit us. And thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, everybody, for your patience.